Hello and uh, welcome to episode 2 of my genetic genealogy video blog. Last week we did a partial reconstruction of my great aunt Nada by using the GEDmatch Lazarus tool in conjunction with the people who match one or more of two kits, which is similar to Ancestry.com's shared matches tool. This week we're going to reconstruct Uncle Pete, who was aunt Nada's husband. However, we're going to use an entirely different process. We're going to use the Lazarus tool but this time in conjunction with the phasing tool and the matching segment tool. Since this process uses a combination of GEDmatch tools, including two of the Tier 1 tools, I'm going to classify this topic as intermediate. Since we're going to be using the same branch of my family as last week, let's review the most significant of the available DNA resources we have at our disposal. Of primary importance, Uncle Pete's daughter, who I referred to last week as Cousin 1, is tested. To use this method of reconstruction that I'm going to describe today, a child of the target has to have tested. Next, we have the DNA of a daughter of Cousin Juan. In other words, the granddaughter of Uncle Pete. While we didn't use her in last week's project, a prerequisite for this week's technique is that we have a parent-child pair like this. We're going to use the DNA of a parent and child to reconstruct the DNA for the parent's father. There are a lot of people out in the universe that have done their DNA so they can learn more about an unknown father. So this demonstration could be especially helpful to accomplish that goal. In fact, I know very little about Uncle Pete. I remember him from when I was a child. He smoked a pipe, and he liked to show slides of his travels at family gatherings. He lived in New Jersey, and years ago, I reviewed his family tree put together by one of my cousins, and I remember he had a lot of New Amsterdam Dutch ancestors. I didn't review that tree in preparation for this video, since I'm very familiar with his wife Aunt Nada's tree, because Aunt Nada is my paternal grandmother's sister. All of Aunt Nada's ancestors happen to be my ancestors. Uh, and I'm not related to Uncle Pete in any way, at least any way that I know. In the next category of resources is my cousin who I referred to last week as Cousin 2. She's the daughter of Cousin 1's sister. So she's also a daughter, a granddaughter of Uncle Pete, not Nada. And she gets her own category today because she is genetically related to both Pete and Nada. Um, in the third category, we have Uncle Michael, a son of Aunt Nada's uh, sister and my grandmother Helen and also not related to Pete. And we have my cousin Richard's DNA. He's the son of Nada's other sister, Sally, uh, also of no known relation to Pete. And then both me and my brother are tested, and again, we're Nada's great nephews with no relation to Pete. In the fourth category, there are the thousands of unknown cousins of Uncle Pete who have tested and uploaded GEDmatch uh, to the database, which will be the key to this reconstruction, since all of our known resources are either on Aunt Nada's side or descendants of both Nada and Pete. Let's start out with a phasing tool. What exactly does a phasing tool do? It's designed to separate data pertaining to the paternal and maternal copies of the child's chromosomes, uh, data which is overlaid and jumbled in the raw data files. So at each position tested, the phasing tool attempts to discern from which parent the child's allele in, was inherited from based on the uh, available alleles. Uh, from one or more parents who have tested and that are inputted into the uh, phasing tool. If you only input one parent, it assembles an output kit for that parent's contribution to the child's DNA, as well as an output kit for the missing parent, basically just using the leftover allele at each position uh, or SNP that was phasable. We'll discuss what makes a particular SNP phasable in another video, but for our purposes today, it suffices to know that about 80% of the tested alleles will be phasable uh, with this tool based on my experience. So the resolution of the uh, output phase kits are pretty good. So what happens if you reverse the roles when you use the phasing tool on GEDmatch, switching the parent and the child? Well, you still get the phased output kits, but what do they represent? Well, let's take a look at our example here where we have a mother and daughter. When you input the daughter as the mother, and the mother is a child, your maternal output file will still represent the DNA shared between the mother and the child, i.e. the real child's maternal copies of her chromosomes, or maternally phased DNA, you can call it. But what you get with the paternal output file is something quite different. You get a compilation of all the DNA cousin one could have passed to her child, but didn't. Sort of an anti-child, or the child's evil half-twin. I say evil because the two output, output files will share no DNA inherited by descent, but will both match cousin one across the entire genome. Together, they will comprise the maternal copy of cousin one. Think of uh, Kit and Carr from the uh, old Knight, Knight Rider series, where Kit and Carr were brothers, both created by the uh, Knight Industries 2000, 
uh, yet they had no shared uh, personality traits. They were uh, evil twins of one another. So let's do this with Cousin Juan and Cousin Juan's child. We'll leave the father blank and simply reverse the roles, putting the child as the mother of Cousin Juan. We'll need the process version of the output kits because we're going to use them with the matching segment tool, which is a type of one-to-many tool. I ran the kits earlier, so you don't have to wait for them to process. So now that we have our phased output kits, one representing the child's maternal side and one representing the child's evil maternal half-twin, let's run each of the kits through the tier one matching segment tool. Since we're using phase kits rather than kits from live donors, let's reduce the thresholds down to 500 SNPs and five centimorgans to reflect the fact that we've greatly reduced the possibility of false positive cousin matches in that range by inputting phase data. The matching segment tool is basically a tool that sorts your top 10,000 autosomal cousin matches if you have 10,000 on each chromosome in order of start position of each segment of DNA they share with you. In other words, it essentially maps your cousins along the chromosomes based on where they match you. If you used unfazed kits, it won't tell you which copy of the chromosome it is. But since we're using phase kits, we don't have that problem. I'm running two instances of the matching segment tool in two Google Chrome tabs, uh, one for each of the output files of the phasing tool. The process of doing so is resource intensive in terms of GEDmatch's computation resources. So it takes a few minutes and I'm gonna fast forward until the process was completed. Okay, so we have our results. Now let's copy and paste the data into Excel so we can work with it in a more versatile environment. Select with the mouse the table from the paternal tab and then hit Control C to copy. Then in one tab of the Excel worksheet, paste the data with the paste special setting, text only. Then we add a tab for the next output kit and repeat the copy and pasting of the evil twin cousin matches. Starting with the first tab in Excel, let's make some formatting adjustments. First, we'll hit Alt-D-F-F to enable auto filtering. Hold down the Alt key, then type D-F-F. Now let's just filter one of the columns to show only blank lines to eliminate these extra spaces that were inserted in the copying and pasting process. Within the filter, deselect all, and then go down to the bottom and select blanks. Then select all of the rows filtered and hit Alt-E-D, which will delete the rows. Then we'll go back to the filter and reselect all the kits so we can see everything. Then we want to auto fit the column. Select all the columns containing data and then hit Alt O C A. That should do the trick. And when we do this again on the other tab, we'll be ready to start our substantive analysis. Our time is limited, so let's limit this video to one chromosome. And we can do the rest off the clock. How about chromosome 7? Chromosome 7 is about 189 centimorgans long, and it doesn't have any major pileup areas. A centimorgan is defined as a 1 in 100 chance uh, in any given generation of there being a recombination event along that strand of DNA. For our purposes, that means that every one centimorgan, cousin one had a 1% chance of switching streams between passing her child DNA from Aunt Nada to passing Uncle Pete's DNA to the child, or vice versa. Based on the statistics, on a 189 centimorgan chromosome, we'd expect somewhere between zero and maybe five switches and streams, uh, although it could be more sometimes. Probably one or two, usually. So let's use the cousin data to find uh, where these recombination events occurred on chromosome seven. I'm going to shade Cousin 1's paternal relatives with blue and maternal with red. Since we're using phase kits in this analysis, we know that any cousin that is significantly overlapping to a known maternal match must also be from that side of the family. It's called triangulation. You only have two copies of chromosomes, so if they match on the same chromosome because the data is phased, then they must be on that same side of the family. We also know, since we have an evil twin situation on the other tab, when one kit matches a cousin of Nada, the other kit must be matching Pete's cousins, and vice versa. In addition to knowing how my other kits are related to Nada, it's also helpful to know that Nada's mother was entirely Scandinavian, uh, from Norway and uh, Sweden, maybe some Finnish ancestors also, and that Nada's father, uh, on paper anyway, was half Jewish and one quarter Alsatian German, 
and the other quarter colonial uh, New Yorker, which is mostly Dutch and English. Uh, it doesn't matter what percents, and doesn't matter which sides of uh, Nada's family, but just keep that in mind, those are her nationalities, which are a little bit different than Pete's, and that's something we can distinguish uh, the two by, in, if we need to, if we don't have uh, cousin matches that we are familiar with along the entire span of the chromosome. So let's hit the match lists in Excel and get to work. So we did it, yay. We've sorted every cousin on chromosome seven into Pete versus Nada. And, uh, or blue and red. So next, let's create a separate tab for our Uncle Pete cousin, because today we're reconstructing Uncle Pete and we don't, we don't need Aunt Nada. We can do that as a separate exercise. Let's filter the data by color and then copy the blue rows from each list into a new tab. Then we'll sort by position and we're looking for a representative kit from every span of DNA possible. Why don't we just use all the kits? because we're going to be using the Lazarus tool, which only has 100 slots, and because we really don't feel like typing in every kit unnecessarily when we only need one over each span of chromosome. We don't want any uh, descendants of Uncle Pete, just cousins. So we'll ignore uh, our cousin, too, who is a descendant of both on Ada and, and Uncle Pete. Uh, otherwise, our resulting uh, output when we put this through the Lazarus kit will be some hybrid of Aunt Nate and Uncle Pete, and that's not what we're looking for. In fact, that's what we started with, uh, with Cousin One, and we just want to isolate Uncle Pete. Well, essentially, we're making an Uncle Pete filter of all these cousins. So let's highlight all the representative kits in yellow that we're going to pick uh, from this list. Okay, let's turn on Auto Filtering, Alt, D, F, F, and only select the yellows. If you're familiar with the Lazarus tool, you'll see where I'm going with this. Uh, we're creating a Lazarus kit for Uncle Pete's chromosome 7 using Cousin 1 as the insider group 1 kit. And we're using all of these representative kits we found, the yellow ones, all cousins of Pete and not Nada, as the outside or group 2 kits. So let's do it. We can use the default settings in the Lazarus tool. Since we only did one chromosome, we're going to generate an LX kit rather than one that could be used in the one-to-many tools, which would be an LL kit, uh, because we're not going to meet the minimum threshold of 1,500 centimorgans with just one chromosome. That We only have maximum, uh, what, 189 centimorgans, I think I said earlier. But that's okay. We'll do one for each chromosome, and then later we'll add all of these sub-Lazarus kits together, and I'll show you how to do that. Addition of uh, Lazarus kits will be done simply by making Cousin 1 in the inside kit, and then using these single chromosome Lazarus kits as outside kits, and the resulting output Lazarus kit will be the addition of those kits. When we've done all 23 chromosomes, we'll certainly have enough reconstructed uh, DNA to do a full LL kit, no problem. You can do this at home with one of your relatives and try it out, and I'll show you Uncle Pete's results next week when I've had time to go through all the chromosomes uh, off the camera. So, the moral of the story, if you don't know about your father, but you have a child, and you know about your mother's side of the family, test yourself and test your child. Also, test some other close relatives and learn as much about your known part of your family as possible. Then try the technique in this tutorial. Obviously, this is not going to work very well for adoptees who don't know anything about either side of their family, unfortunately, uh, because it does require knowledge about one side of the family and the uh, availability of some cousins on that side to test. Any questions or comments, uh, drop them down below. You can also subscribe if you want to see more of these videos. Uh, click the bell if you want to receive email notifications when I post another episode, and go try this out yourself.